Tuesday at 2 p.m. Is this the Rome Kids Show right now? What's going on, everyone? This is really exciting. Nice to see you all here. Uh, today I'm at home for a very special episode about coral reefs. So uh, if you got some kids in your household, maybe there's a teacher in a school, uh, today we're learning about coral reefs with my good friend, uh, Dr. Sebastian Savitz. Uh, so he'll be joining us live on the show today. We're going to be making our own magic paper towel art things too, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, but yeah, this is a kid show. This is the wrong kid show. Uh, last week we were in Winnie the Pooh. Uh, so if you saw that exhibit and really like it, let us know. Uh, we think it's a really beautiful exhibit. Earlier in this season of the wrong kid show, uh, we were in the paleo we were in the dinosaur gallery with our good friend paleontologist uh, Dr. David Evans. That was really cool. Uh, we've talked about citizen science uh, this year. We made ice cream in an earlier episode. So lots of cool things happening uh, on the ROM Kids Show. Uh, coming up later on uh, in, the, in the series, we have our friend Jeanette from the museum who's gonna be talking to us about what does discovery really mean? Uh, Kim Tate, who's also a doctor at the museum uh, and studies uh, Mars and comets will be on. So lots of fun things coming up on the ROM Kids Show in the weeks and months to come. But today is all about coral reefs. Uh, so let's get to it. I think we're at the theme park portion of the event. Oh, it's Isaac and Sarah. Hey, what's going on, friends? Big fans of Isaac and Sarah in this household and at ROM Camp. Definitely two pillars of the, of the camper community. Uh, welcome. We got some really fun projects and a really cool special guest. Uh, but with that, time to go. Theme song portion of the event is the ROM Kids Show. Welcome to the ROM Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the ROM Kids Show starring you and me. That's it. That's the theme song portion of the event done. It is the ROM Kids Show. It is Tuesday at 2, and we are learning about coral reefs. Let's get set up and move over to the art table um, and get ready. You know, it's fall now, so we get to wear like uh, really like oversized sweaters, which I really like. This one was designed uh, by future paleontologist, longtime ROM Kids camper, current counselor, Henry Sharp. It has dinosaurs all over the back. Big fan of that one. So what are we doing today? We are making, um, we're gonna make some coral reefs, okay, that magically appear using paper towel, okay, you need two sheets. They can be connected or not, but you need two sheets of paper towel, all right? You can use toilet paper too if that's what you have, but I know it's a hot commodity these days. Uh, you need Sharpies, all right? Bunch of Sharpies, critical, necessary, need that. Um, you need washable markers. We have really tiny ones in this household, cute size washable markers, but any washable marker will do. You will need a container. Shout out to Megan and Andrew for getting this for us in our household. Uh, but you're gonna need a container to put water in so that uh, we can do the magic part of our uh, paper towel art. And then of course, you're gonna need some water. And our water comes in the perfectly branded water cup. Water cup. All right, so that's what we're doing today. Make sure as well, because we're using paper towel and we're using Sharpies, um, as I found out in our household this morning, if you just draw straight on paper towel with a Sharpie, it will bleed re right through and uh, stain your art table, which is also our dinner table. We, so our, it's our everything table. So uh, we came up with a new solution, and by we, I mean Courtney, uh, putting down, what's this called? Wax paper? We put some wax paper underneath to make a little drop sheet, all right? So do what you need to do, stay safe, make sure you got like, some guidance from the leadership in your household to make sure that whatever you're doing is right and okay to go. Okay, so the first thing what I want you to do is I want you to draw a fish. We're doing coral reefs today, and we know in coral reefs so many different types of animals live. Invertebrates, vertebrates, draw whatever you want. I drew this fish, uh, which is like the fish from Finding Nemo with the scar, and I know it has a proper name, but I forgot. Anywho, it's a great, it's a great fish. We really love that. So for the sake of speeding things up, I drew a fish in Sharpie, in black Sharpie, on the very top sheet of our two sheets 
of paper towel, okay? Um, and that's gonna be the basis of like the animal. And then once we, what we're gonna do underneath of it is we're gonna draw our coral reef ecosystem. Then once that's done, we're gonna drop this into the water and then the ecosystem behind it will appear and that's sort of the magic of it, right? Like I like gimmicks when we do art. I like some sort of mixed media component and that's where the mixed media comes in, okay? And it will magically appear and it will be super, super cool. So draw your fish first. Um, an angel fish, that's a good one. Um, draw any fish, all right? Oh, this is an angel fish, cool. I drew an angel fish, thank you. Oh, and that right there is our good friend, um, Isaac and Sarah. So behind that, what I want you to do then is draw your ecosystem. And so I'm gonna do that right now, but first what I wanna do is I wanna introduce my good, good friend. Whoa! Hey, it's Dr. Sebastian Convitz. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jerome. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone out there. This is really exciting. Um, Sebastian is really cool. He's worked at the museum for a number of years. I remember the first time I met Sebastian, I was standing outside waiting for kids to come to camp. And uh, he was introduced to me as the new curator of invertebrates at the museum. And I told him, oh, I run a kid's camp at the ROM. And the first thing he said was, let me know how I can help out. And so you've helped out many a year, many a times over the years, but thanks for also helping us out during a pandemic. We really appreciate it. Um, Anytime, you're on it. It's, it's an honor to be on the show. Oh, we're so excited. So friends at home, I'm gonna start drawing my coral reef back here while we start talking with Sebastian. Feel free to drop in any questions about coral reefs or invertebrates into the group chat below and we'll get to them. But right now, invertebrates, that's a big word. Can you tell us like what you do as a curator of invertebrates? Yep, absolutely. Um, it is a, a, a pretty big word, a word that most people probably haven't heard. Although, oddly enough, most people know what a vertebrate is. And of course, vertebrates are animals that have a backbone, just like we do, right? And the backbone helps you to stand upright. It allows you to move. It also allows all the organs inside of your body to stay in one place. Now, invertebrates, on the other hand, are all the animals that do not have a backbone. Um, they use a variety of different methods to actually keep their body intact uh, instead of having a backbone. Um, but essentially, it's, it's all the animals that we can think of out, of out there in the world, all the creepy crawlies, all the worms, all the jellyfish, all the crabs and the shrimp mm -hmm. and all that. Those yeah. are all invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. Now, one of the invertebrates, and I think we'll, we'll get to this in a bit too, but one of the invertebrates that you love are leeches. And can you tell us, like, I know we're sort of veering off topic a bit, but it's because I came prepared with picks. Can you tell us what your, what your love is about leeches? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I'd like to challenge anyone to think about anything that you, that you don't love about leeches, right? And one of the things, of course, is that um, they invade your personal space normally. They come in and they take um, part of your sort of essence. They take your blood because most leeches actually feed on blood. But one of the cool things about leeches, I think, that most people don't know is that leeches live all over the world. They live in ponds and lakes, as we know. They also live in the ocean where they feed on fish and crustaceans. Um, and they also live on land. So there are major parts of, of the world where leeches only live on land, right? They've been found on every continent, including the waters of Antarctica. Whoa. Uh, and they are just really, really good at surviving. Uh, they're really good at what they do. Most people don't know this, but there are about 700 species of leeches in the world. Now, that might, might sound like a lot, especially to people that don't like leeches. Um, but if you compare it to other animal groups, it's actually quite a low number. And despite of that low number of species in the world, uh, leeches do occur everywhere. And I think the last thing that, it, that is, is really intriguing to me and part of my research at the ROM um, is trying to figure out the evolution of blood feeding. Hmm. Now, leeches need a couple of different things to be able to feed on blood, and one thing that they need are blood thinners in their saliva. So when they bite someone or something or some other animal, the blood doesn't clot and become really hard, right? So they, they have these uh, chemicals in their saliva that keep the blood flowing whilst they're feeding. And they're the strongest blood thinners that are known to man. Whoa. Now, uh, 
Uh, Isaac and Sarah dropped into the group chat that they loved Bloodsuckers, uh, which, you know, that award-winning exhibit we had uh, last year. Absolutely smash it. We love it. That was an exhibit that you worked on too, right? That's right, yeah. So I was the co-curator together with uh, Dr. Doug Curry, who's the, the resident entomologist, or one of them at the, at the WOM. Now, entomologist means that he works on insects, of course. Um, Doug works on black flies, and I work on leeches. So it was sort of a, a natural uh, joining of our forces to create that exhibit. Yeah, it was a wonderful exhibit. We really liked it. And I think what's really cool about the museum, and we haven't even talked about coral reefs yet, but what I love about the ROM is that we're a natural history museum, we're a world cultures museum, and that we do a ton of research. Like there's scientists such as you behind the scenes that do all this cool research and then turn it in to like real shows at the museum. Yeah, I like to hear it. I, I, I like to think that the shows come across like that as well. <clears throat> And you're right, Kieran. I mean, the, the ROM is unique in that, you know, we have both the, a world culture side, we have an art side, and we also have natural history. And, and very few museums around the world actually have the capacity um, to put on shows that, that speak both to the, the animal that we love, right, but also the art that they have inspired and the cultural objects that, that uh, they have inspired as well. So I think that, you know, that's really what we were trying to do with Bloodsuckers, and I hope everyone liked it. Well, we certainly have a lot of people in uh, the group chat who love uh, bloodsuckers. So yeah, and in this household as well. Okay, now one of my favorite things about the museum is that uh, I, it's not, it's dinosaurs. Uh, but another thing that I do love is that we have all these like live creatures like in exhibits, right? We have the the the, the aquariums in the hands-on galleries, and we also have the coral reef aquarium in the Shad Gallery. And a very quick story, like maybe 10 years ago, I was teaching a five-year-old group, and they loved, loved, loved the Coral Reef Aquarium. And so every day, we had to go say hi to our friends in the Coral Reef Aquarium. And that was just, it was mandatory. It was told, the students told me we had to do that. And a good teacher responds to what their students want to see. And so every week we went to see that Coral Reef Aquarium. Tell us what you love about that Coral Reef. Well, I think, I mean, there, there are so many things that I love about it. I think that the main thing is, is just that it's full of so much diversity, a, a lot more diversity than meets the eye. Um, at first glance, when you walk up to it, you see Nemo, or you see Dory, or you see all those other fishes that you know about. But if you look really closely, there are lots of small worms in there. There are lots of um, small crustaceans. There are lots of sea urchins. And there are just lots and lots of smaller animals that people might not think about and people might not see. And I think it's a learning experience. It explains to people how uh, ecosystems work, right? That, that animals live in harmony with each other. And the problem is that if you take each of, each of those components, or if you take one of the components out, then the ecosystem can actually collapse because they're so integral uh, to the system. They're so important to the, to the wellness of the entire ecosystem. Um, that if you take one out, it can pull. So I think that's a, a real learning experience of the aquarium. And of course, it doesn't harm anything. These are live animals that move around, right? It makes it a lot more fun to look at. Now, uh, so you're talking a little bit about diversity, and today, obviously, got to be thematic. I wore my shark socks today. Wear my shark socks uh, to be, you know, on theme for the show. Um, coral reefs are so diverse, and all those creatures that you know you mentioned that live there, but. I guess what I want to know is, is the coral reef itself, is that also alive? Yeah, it's a good question. A lot of the times when we, when people think of coral reef, they think of, of it as being uh, a rock formation, right? That just is not alive. It's, uh, it's not an animal. It's not a plant. It's not a fungus. It's just a piece of rock. Well, the truth can, well, that can be further from the truth, actually, because um, coral reefs are made up of millions and millions of animals. In fact, a coral reef, to understand a coral reef, I think you have to understand what a coral is. And a coral is a colony of small, small animals. Thousands of animals that come together to create this piece of rock, and then they live on the rock, and they come out and they feed from the rock. And as they create new generations moving forward, um, those rocks actually create big reefs in the ocean. And so I think the, the, best, thing, the best way to understand what a um, coral reef is, 
is to understand where the coral is, and then you can think of those corals as just expansive throughout um, the ocean. Now, I'm showing some pictures of some coral reefs, like up to our friend up on the show. And coral reefs are full of not only these animals, but the, all the coral seems really diverse and different shaped as well. How does that happen? Do they have like different functions? Yeah, you know what? Some of them have different functions. So one of the cool things about coral, and people think that coral might be one species, you know, there are thousands and thousands of different species of corals in the world. And if you see the different formations in the ocean, chances are that those are actually different species. And just like different species of other animals, like vertebrates that people understand, right? A dinosaur will look very different from a goat, will look very different from a horse. And so those different, those different formations in the ocean normally means that those are different species of corals. Okay, we have one question from the group chat right now is, what does a coral eat? Yeah, good question. Um, well, corals are so small, and the individual animals that make up the colony of corals are made up of two different parts, basically. Um, the, well, the, the entire structure is called a polyp, but the polyp comes out of a hole inside of this rock structure, and it has tentacles at the top. Now, of course, they're, they're sort of stuck in this rock formation, so they won't be able to move around. So what they're trusting is that the food comes to them. So can you think of anything that sort of floats around in, in water, Kira? Oh, maybe like plankton or something like that? Right, so really, really small particles in the water. Now there are two different types of plankton that they feed on. Um, one is called phytoplankton, and the other one is called zooplankton. Now zooplankton are small, small animals that cannot swim against currents. They just sort of go with the currents in the ocean and, and sort of travel wherever the, the, the current takes them. And then phytoplankton are actually the plant sort of version of zooplankton. Small, small pieces of plants that also go with the flow of the, the ocean. And what the, what the corals actually are trusting is that the currents will bring these small pieces of food past them. And they grab onto them with the tentacles and then they pull the tentacles into the mouth and then they release all of the food inside of the mouth, and then the tentacles come back out again and start feeding. Huh. So I see, so we got these these, these corals, they all live together, and they're beautiful and, and they're gorgeous. What gives them all of their like unique colors? Yeah, so corals actually, well, most corals, I should say, the corals that live in really shallow water, um, they require a symbiont. Now, a symbiont is something, some, some animal or some plant that lives inside of your body. And corals actually have an association with these small algae that live inside of their body. And these algae actually photosynthesize. They create energy from sunlight. Uh, and they provide the corals with all the food that they need. But importantly, and very interestingly, they are the ones that give the color to the coral reefs. They're called zooxanthellae. That's a very, very big word. Mm -hmm. But they are the ones that create the color because they themselves have the color. So coral, believe it or not, is just kind of white when it's um, when when it doesn't have any any of these um, algae living inside of it. So it's sort of just white or beige. But when they have these symbionts or these animals and algae living inside, they get really, really beautiful and colorful. Now, uh, we got another question from the group chat real quick right here from one of our younger friends. And I, I'm going to say, I think it's Jacoby, um, is wants to know, are there freshwater corals? Because we've been talking about ocean corals so far, um, but are there ones in freshwater? That's a really, really good question, Jacoby. Um, there are there are freshwater corals, but it's a bit more complicated than that because um, you know how some animals were not really sure what they are. Is that a bug? Is it a fly? Is it something else? Well, these corals were not really sure where they placed in this bigger picture of of how everything uh, how everything in the world is related to each other. 
right? So we don't know exactly that they are coral, but there are coral-like creatures that live in freshwater. But it's important to note that almost all of the corals that we know about actually live in the ocean. It's very, very few that live in freshwater. So where, so right now I'm showing you a little map, and it seems like all the coral reefs seem to be centered around the equator. Why is that? Yeah, that's right. They seem to be there, I think, because, you know, why do animals travel anywhere? Or why do they live where they do? Well, it's probably because everything in their surroundings is good for them, right? So it's the right temperature. There's the right amount of um, acid in the water. There's the right amount of food everywhere. And that's why that, that belt around the equator seems to be really, really good for um, coral reefs. Now, the other thing, of course, is that coral reefs, when they live in shallow waters, they really need a lot of sunlight. And sunlight occurs in, in sort of a stable fashion around the equator. As you move towards the poles, you get really dark winters, really light summers, but you want that sort of continuous light throughout the year. And so that's why the equator also seems to be a very good spot for coral. Now, one of the things I want to mention or sort of show on my, my drawing here is I've drawn some coral reefs or some coral segments. And then what I've done is I've drawn them in Sharpie. So they're going to be permanent on our page. But what I did on the inside is I colored them in with washable marker. So that when we put them into the wash, uh, into the water, the color is going to lift. And that's going to speak to our point about how coral are actually white. Um, and that they can then lose that color um, if they're in danger. And so it's something we hear a lot, I think, about is climate change and the impact that it's having on our planet. And it's a very dangerous and destructive thing. You know, we're going towards a climate catastrophe right now. But how is that affecting and impacting our coral reefs? Well, it's impacting the coral reefs massively. Um, I'd say that it's one of the one of the, the um, sort of most threatened areas of the world are coral reefs. And one one of the ways that climate change is affecting it is by carbon dioxide pollution. The more carbon dioxide we release, the more of it actually gets incorporated into the ocean. And it gets bound into the water of the ocean. What happens then is that um, something that's called ocean acidification happens. And what that means is that the acidity in the ocean goes up. And as a result, the Sosan Feli that we spoke about before, these algae that live inside of the corals, they actually die. And when they when they die, the coral becomes completely white and it cannot feed. So eventually it dies, but first what happens is that it becomes completely white because the color um, that's given by these algae disappears. So what we see then is what we call coral bleaching. Now that occurs in, in parts of the world and it's completely devastating for the coral reefs um, because they're dying out. And I think one of the biggest effects of that, of course, is that all the animals that are associated with the coral reefs they also die. Hmm. And people have estimated that as much as between 20 and 30 percent of all species that live in the ocean, right? All animals that live in the ocean, take 20 percent of them, those are the ones that live on coral reefs. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. And the absolute 20 percent of, of animals in the, in, in the ocean, that would be completely devastating both for the animals but also for human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, another question from the group chat is, does coral feel pain? Like, I guess when, like, as a, or like other invertebrates, like when they, when, when they go through this process? Um, so we're not entirely sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, corals belong to this group of organisms um, called Cnidaria, which also includes the jellyfish and sea anemones. Um, and one of the cool things about this group is that they are some of the first animals that came about on Earth. Huh. Um, some of the first animals that, that popped up. And in corals, we see the beginning of what we would call a nerve system. Now, the nervous system needs to be in place for an animal to feel pain, as we explain pain, right? It's sort of synapses in your brain, and that's what makes you feel pain, right? You, the, 
electrical impulses in your brain, and that's that's what makes us feel pain. And we're not entirely sure if corals can feel pain because their nervous system just isn't developed enough. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know. If I had to venture a guess, I'd say that they probably don't feel pain in the way that we feel pain. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do they feel pain when the, when the algae inside of them die? Um, probably not, but I would say that it's probably not too, they're probably not too, um, too happy that, that they do die, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we're almost at the end of our show, so I have a couple more questions left, okay? So we've, we're, we've learned that coral reefs are really important. They're a diverse ecosystem, something like 20% of uh, ocean life is involved with coral reefs. Um, so they're really, really critical to, to, to our world. And we've also learned that climate change is damaging them, that we can get bleaching, which then takes away the homes for all of these creatures. So what can we do to help our coral reefs? Yeah, well, I think there are lots of things that we can do. I mean, it starts with something that seems so, so easy to do as to not throw plastic in the ocean. In fact, I would say don't use or use as little plastic as, as you can uh, throughout your everyday life. Um, the second thing, of course, is more sort of, uh, you know, with bigger companies more than with uh, personal, you know, what we can do. But we can try to make uh, larger companies understand the, the positive effects of having coral reefs, the benefits of having coral reefs, and importantly, what will happen if coral reefs actually disappear. And what the big corporations can do then is prevent sort of off-running of chemicals into the ocean. Um, we can create um, sanctuaries in the ocean where coral reefs can live and thrive on their own without any human impact. Um, and I think just sort of think about the everyday things that you would do for, for the world in terms of, uh, you know, uh, not using chemicals, not using bleaching, and definitely don't let it run into the into your garden, and all that stuff actually trickles down and helps uh, oceans as well. So um, I think there are lots of things that we can do: no plastic, no chemicals, and then make make big corporations understand. I think that's where one of the fundamental points can be made: reduce, reuse, recycle. Do it right. Do it correctly at home, but also you know talk to corporations through your wallet right like money talks do that and write some letters it can go a long way for us to pressure corporations to make better choices um, now one of the things that's happening at the museum is that we have obviously our coral reef tank it's awesome it's beautiful as we know popular fan favorite um, it's going through a little bit of an update that's kind of exciting what what's happening to our coral reef tank at the rock yeah, really good. Uh, it is indeed going through a bit of an update um, and hopefully a bit of a rebound. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, make the labeling with regards to the aquarium uh, a bit more uh, understandable, a bit easier to, to see the different um, organisms that are in the, the aquarium. Um, we're going to have a touchable coral reef sort of uh, model that everyone can come and feel. We're also going to have a case right next to the aquarium that's going to explain what coral reefs are and also explain the problems with coral reef bleaching, how it can affect other animals, but also how it affects humans inevitably in the end, because it will. And so we, we try to highlight the corals uh, for the beauty uh, or beautiful organisms that they are, but also tell people about the problems that are involved with, with, with coral bleaching uh, and ocean acidification, global climate change, and, and stuff like that. It was really exciting. It's really cool that as a museum, we can like adapt and, and grow as the science changes. Uh, and I can say I've seen the piece that Georgia made um, because it was in my kiln and it fired and it looks beautiful. It came out great. Amazing. Unlike that one time when we had- You're lucky here, and I haven't seen it yet. It looks really good. Uh, one time when we had the Mayan exhibit like many years ago, Georgia made this incredible piece um, and we put it into the kiln, and I didn't put anything else in with it, so it exploded. Right. Uh, and so she spent like all the weeks of work uh, on this piece that was supposed to go into the exhibit. And so it was after that that I learned that if you have nothing else to put in, because we usually put kids' artwork in with George's work that goes in the galleries, that um, I just fill it with furniture. Uh, and so we did it this time. It came out okay. We're very happy about that. Um, love, love to hear it. Love to see this exhibit come to life. So 
Um, and my final question for you, Sebastian, and thank you for hanging out with us today, is how, how does someone become uh, a scientist like yourself? Well, you know what? I think it starts with an interest in, in my case, the astral kingdom or the world around us, right? So it starts with an interest, and then I think anyone that wants to can become a scientist. And remember, everyone out there, you can do exactly what you want to do in this life, right? So if you want to become a scientist, then I think one of the good things to do is, um, is to go to school and, and try to understand what science is, um, try to explore the natural kingdom, um, and actually um, you know, get help from people who are scientists and get engaged in the ROM, try to do public reach out, um, and, and just get engaged with any aspect of science that you can. And we'd be more than happy to, to accommodate that at the ROM. And, and uh, I, you know, that it's, it's one, of the, one of the beautiful things about this institution is that we have such a public engagement that comes in. Um, but remember, you have to go to school as well, and that's a really important point. And so if you like science at school, then continue to go to school and take science classes um, and try to understand the animals, the plants, or the fungi that are around us. And remember, and a couple episodes ago, we were talking about citizen science, and that's something that you can do yourself. You can do it through various apps like iNaturalist, by allowing you to explore your community safety, safely with your parents, uh, with your adults, um, to document the cool things around you, let that inspire you, take you through school, take that biology, uh, and then you know, fun things happen when you go to university, uh, and then maybe if you really go for it and wanna get a PhD, and you're interested in inverts, maybe you can hang out with Sebastian too, uh, and do your degree with him. So I was wondering, do you want to see our magic uh, paper towel art take action here? Are you kidding me? Absolutely. Okay, so we're really excited. As you can see, two pages, two pieces of paper towel. On the bottom one, we have our coral reef, which is filled uh, with permanent markers and washable markers to show how uh, corals can um, become bleached over time and also to show the water around it. And then on the very top in permanent marker, we have our fish, our angelfish, as uh, Isaac and Sarah so helpfully pointed out earlier. So what you're going to do is you're gonna pour your water into your basin. And I'm gonna move my basin over here, okay? And then in our water branded cup, I'm gonna pour this water right in. It's gonna fill the bottom of our container. You know what, I'm gonna throw a little bit more in, thanks to the back of water, okay? So it's all covered at the bottom. It's not a ton of water, but it's right there. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop it in. Make sure you take a picture of your artwork first because it will change when you put it in the water, okay? So now I'm gonna drop it in and then Sebastian, I'm gonna pick up the computer so that you can see too, all right? Here, can we see it? All right, here we go. Whoa! And you can see how it appears. Um, you can see how like the, the washable marker starts to you know, move around. You can see how the washable marker in the coral is starting to come out as well to show the bleaching. And you can see our fish sort of swimming right on through. Okay, so that was really cool. I love this project. Um, honestly, it's one I think about all the time. Um, so Sebastian, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. That was so cool. It was great to have another doctor on our show, another uh, curator at the museum on our show, and a wonderful friend. Um, we're, we're back next Tuesday at 2 p.m. with another episode, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, remember that this show will appear on YouTube tomorrow, okay? You can find all the directions and the materials you need on the ROM website. If you take any pictures, please feel free to tag me, Kieran C. Mokerji, or the ROM Toronto, at ROM Toronto, in your pics. We love, love, love seeing your art. If you're at home with your adults, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. And if you're uh, in the classroom with your teachers, thank you so much as well. Shout out to all the teachers and parents doing wonderful work this time of year. Sebastian, again, thank you. Thank you to our wonderful producer, Courtney. Uh, lots of really good stuff in the group chat saying they really liked hanging out with us. That was cool. Stay safe, wear a mask, we love you. Bye everyone.